Hello and welcome to the podcast, Every Moment is Sacred, where we interweave meditation and healing into everyday life. I am your host, Rain Elizabeth Stickney. Now, let us begin. Hey, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. I have a really, really special guest for you today. Of course, all of my guests are special, and I'm pleased to introduce every one of them every time. Today, we have the magical, mystical, nature-loving stepfather from my childhood. This is my stepdad, who was married to my mom for a few years. They lived together such that I was able to move from my father's house and live with them, which was really special for me because I really wanted a different experience. And Bodhi and my mom provided that experience for me and my younger sister. And living with Bodhi was so fantastic. He was my first breathwork teacher by way of teaching me the silver flute. I was learning flute in my new school because I moved into a new neighborhood when I got to live with my mom and Bodhi. And at my new school, I took up the flute and Bodhi is a flutist, (laughs) a flautist. He is a musician. He is a sound healer. He is a recording artist. He is an amazing creative spirit. And I am so, so happy to share this two-part conversation with you about sound healing. Bodhi Starwater is the founder of Soundscape Oasis. You can look him up by going to soundscapeoasis.com. And there's even a special button there that says, contact me, and you can send him a message and he will put you on the list to find out about his new book. He's already written one book called The Tao of Music, and his new book is coming out soon, The Five Elements of Sound Healing. He also has a short film documentary on YouTube, which is so well done, and it really captures and shares his spirit in such a good way. I recommend everyone watching that documentary, whether you know what sound healing is, you're curious about sound healing, or you have no idea. It's just over a half hour and it's mesmerizing in the best way. That documentary is called Bodhi Starwater, A Journey of Sound and Silence. You can also find Bodhi all over the internet in so many different ways on social media, on Bandcamp. Um, He has his own YouTube channel. He performs in person. He lives in Mount Shasta and he has a sound healing temple there where he holds live events and private events. He is just a wealth of sound and silence and silence as sound. He uses a lot of natural objects in his sound healing and music. And he also uses a huge variety of instruments. You have the opportunity to hear some of his many instruments because at the end of this episode, I am not sharing my normal outro. I am sharing one of his songs And the song that I will share is called Ring of Love from the album Chi, Q-I. This is a wonderful album that I actually used in my experience of birthing my son. And a lot of his music is like that. It takes the listener on a journey. And for me, labor was a journey. And so it was just perfect for about midway through 
when I had a, a long wait, I had a very long labor with my son. And the album Chi was fantastic for ushering me through in a really good way. And this song, Ring of Love, is, I'm searching for the right word, it's eloquent and resonant with the heart. As I mentioned, Bodhi is a sound healer, a musician, an author, a recording artist, and everything he does is with the intention to empower people to manifest their deepest dreams and ultimate potential. He is such a special man and a dearly, dearly special person. I know you'll just love him as I do. You can find his music on all of the online music platforms, including bodimusic.bandcamp.com, where you can see the full selection. And I also like checking him out on Linktree. He can be found there at Bodhi Starwater. And that gives you all his social media tags, his website, different ventures he's on. So check him out there. And something that is so fun is in this episode, as well as the episode next week, every once in a while, Bodhi breaks out into song. He shares special quotes. He just lights up the stage, so to speak, with his presence. Now, with great honor, here is one of my favorite family members, Bodhi Starwater. Oh, and let me remember, because there's no outro at the end, what I usually say is thank you for listening, which is absolutely true. You bring joy to my heart with your presence, and you can find out all about me and the things that I'm offering on my website, rainelizabeth.org. In fact, if you would like to share gratitude with me, which is a daily practice I offer, send me an email and I'll get you connected. Healing at rainelizabeth.org. And I hope you remember to rate, review, subscribe, share this episode or any part of this podcast as it helps to build and grow the audience and share the love, in this case, the love of music. But there is so much love on this podcast all for the love of creativity, healing, and meditation in everyday life. And now, the moment we all have been waiting for, Bodhi Starwater. Starwater, my stepfather from childhood. I love you so much. <laughs> oh, I love you too. Great to be here. Thank you so much for being here. I think this is our first time together in a professional capacity. Yes, we haven't ever recorded anything together before. What are you grateful for today, Bodhi? I am grateful for my breath. I'm grateful for you in my life. I'm grateful for the beauty of nature, the elemental beauty, the water, earth, fire, air, ether, how they interplay inside me and around me and how I get to dance in that world. I appreciate your dance in that world and through this world and through the world of my life. I heard you name earth, air, fire, water, ether. Is that right? Yes. Are those the five elements of sound healing? 
Those are typically known as the five elements of nature. I associated them with sound healing principles as a way into the world of sound healing and a way of understanding sound healing in a practical sense. I don't know if there's any other traditions that relate them specifically to sound healing in the way that I do. That actually might be a fun inquiry. So I use them in my sound healing practice as I use them in my life. I use them in my life as a way to balance the elements. And I think it's also a tradition in, uh, in Ayurveda. Uh, in, in some Ayurvedic and healing practices, they use the elements, and I think uh, acupuncture also uses them in the meridians of balancing the fire and the earth and the water, the air and the elements, and ether, and they call it metal, I think. So it is a traditional way of looking at life and a little bit scientific in the sense that scientists can study the elements. And there's also a way that it's used in spiritual traditions so in a way, I just created my own understanding of sound healing using the elements as a gateway, as a doorway into conversation and as a starting place to learn from. Mm -hmm. How did you get interested in sound healing? I think it's always been an awareness of how powerful sound is. From when very young, I, I understood and felt the power of sound, the beauty of music, to make people feel better. Just music has a way of opening up our hearts or our minds to new things. It's the vibrations, I just, <clears throat> I understood it from a long time ago, and so I didn't really come into it consciously until maybe I was in my, uh, <clears throat> my 20s and 30s and learning about sound and being a music teacher and a musician, I started understanding the power of sound and reading more about it. Probably just a natural evolution of seeing how powerful music is in the world. Yeah, so it's always called me the world of sound and music. And sometime in the 1970s, I discovered the word sound healing and started to associate with that in my own self. And in, in the 1980s, I had a sound healing duo with Janet Bray. We mm. had crystal, um, we didn't even have crystal bowls. We had Tibetan bowls, gongs, conch shells, flutes. And we did a lot of sound healing concerts all during the 80s. It was, uh, it was a, a fringe thing at that point. And now it's pretty mainstream. Yes, I remember her. And I remember you and her together and... Bodhi, you and I lived with my sister, Crystal, and our mom in a little house in Santa Rosa, California. And I remember Janet coming over with her Tibetan bowls and you with your musical instruments. And even though as a child, I was very embarrassed about our fringe culture of our family, like we had crystals all over the house and plants in a meditation room and sound healing was a regular thing, but I also enjoyed it so much that it was deep, deep, deep in my soul, resonant with who I truly am and your time with Janet Bray and all of the music that you shared with me has really helped me throughout all the years I've known you. Hmm. I think you used one of my albums in your birthing process. Yes. Chi, is that what it's called? Chi, yeah, the Chi yeah. album. Chi the, the, UI, the Chi album is phenomenal because it's a journey. And so it helped me during my labor with my son to take me through the progression of sensation and the time waiting. I had a very long labor and your music just sailed me right through. That's interesting because the album Cloud Etchings, which I made when I was when you were very little, was used. I have letters still from then. I got five different letters. People used to write letters in in the olden days, <laughs> paper, and uh, they. I got these letters from people all over the country who 
used cloud etchings for their labor, for their birth process. Mm. They listened to it over and over and over again. So that kind of music is timeless in that way. It has a way of creating a sacred container to drop into and, and rest in and, and be able to balance or whatever's going on because obviously labor is a very intensive experience. I have not been through it. I have heard enough about it to know that it's a, it's a, it's a portal all its own and a very sacred thing. Obviously life, if, if life is sacred at all and every moment is sacred, then birth is certainly the opening of that portal for us humans to come into this experience Yes. Yes. It's such a sacred portal to be in and being a mother, I can say that it was so clear to me in the birth of my son that I was not giving birth. I was not really giving anything. I was only making way for his gigantic life to move through me. And my number one job through the labor that I experienced was to just get out of the way so that he could come through. <laughs> well, that's pretty good analogy for all create creative ideas and all source inspired creativity is to just open up to that and allow it to come through to get out of the way at the same time to be fully responsible for translating as it were into a human experience that divine recognition. Mm -hmm. Do you feel divine recognition as you play your music? Oh, absolutely. When I'm playing music, I really go and more and more actually in these last few months when I play, I, I go into a pretty deep space of surrender and breath. And the more I train myself to just be in the breath, the more awareness I have of the breath being like the ocean waves. There's something about tuning into the ocean waves. I mean, I've been to the ocean many times in my life. It's my favorite place to be. It's the, it's, if I could live anywhere, it would be near the ocean and someday I will. The ocean waves and the breath are identical. The ocean waves never stop, never. It's falls on the shore, goes back out. The ocean, the tides move back and forth. And the breath is exactly the same. Every breath in, every breath out is a wave. And the more I've been tuning into that the last couple of years, there's an incredible peacefulness and calm in a way. There's a a knowingness that this is what it is, this is all it is. And so accepting that, being in that, it can help wash away all anxiety and all the fears and all the uncertainty and all the unknown. Because in a way it's known that there's gonna be another breath, there's gonna be another wave. And if there isn't, then, then I'll definitely be in another dimension, <laughs> whatever that dimension is. I have no experience with uh, near-death experiences, but I've heard enough to know that it's a different dimension, a different portal, a different reality. And some people say there's multiple realities coexisting, mm -hmm. but somehow managing living in this reality, the breath and the waves is a very fundamental premise from which I work and live every day. Mm -hmm. The breath and the waves are a very fundamental premise of how you live and work every day. Wow, you really a good listener. I love listening. Let's circle round to breath and the importance of it. And for anyone who might be interested in a proper way of breathing, which I don't mean as a judgment. What I mean by that is that you, Bodhi, were my very first breath work teacher. <laughs> Oh, the flute. Didn't we practice yes. the flute? Oh, my God. Right. Yes, and you laid me down so that I was on my back, stretched out, and you placed a pillow on my belly. And you said, now, Rain, breathe in so that you make that pillow rise up to the ceiling. 
<laughs> and breathe out so that that pillow sinks down to the ground. And oh, that was so helpful. That was my first breathwork instruction ever. <laughs> I'm going to have to remember that. I have to remember, that's a good little way to start for sure. <laughs> yeah, and the pillow to the ceiling and then let it drop to the ground. Yeah. And it was tangible for me. I was nine. And so I needed a very tangible, simple instruction. And I was learning to play the silver flute. And although I had a teacher at school, you were my at home private teacher and you helped me along so beautifully. I, are you still playing the flute at all? I'm not, but I think about it all the time. <laughs> you have that beautiful flute I gave you, that native flute. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for reminding me. I I allow my son to play it a lot. And so we have it around. And yes, I need to pick it back up again. Just leave it around and pick it up. Just two mm -hmm. minutes. Mm -hmm. take, take a breath in. Let the pillow rise. <sighs> Drop the pillow. Long tones. Relaxed neck and long tones. That's how you start the flute. Relaxed mm -hmm. neck and long tones. Just breath. So it's just... In fact, any instrument, whether it's a harmonica or a flute or a saxophone or a violin, breathe in, long tone. Of course, the violin can do a note forever, like a didgeridoo, because it can loop the bow. But it's a really great way to start music and drop into the sacredness of music by just aligning your instrument with your breath. Beautiful memory. Thank you for that. You know, it's one that I tell people all the time. So I thought I would share it with you too. I really loved the instruction you gave me around creating sound and using breath to do so, so that there's a strength and a gentleness all at once. Gentle strength. <clears throat> that was a song on my first album, which I think I made long before I met you. So what of sound healing and and the recipient of sound healing what is happening there you're the creator of the music and then you might have an audience or a person before you what is your hope and your dream for them i love uh the famous quote by jonathan goldman one of the <clears throat> one of the preeminent sound healers in america he you know, his famous quote is frequency plus intention equals healing. So that is a really profound, simple way to contextualize what we're doing as sound healers. Like any true, quote, healer knows that they're not doing the healing. We're just creating a container for the body to heal itself. The wisdom of the body, the innate wisdom of the body itself knows how to align itself just like every plant knows how to grow and every animal knows how to grow we're humans we naturally know humans have a little more challenge because we have the mind that gets in the way and the mind thinks it knows more than the body wisdom so when i'm playing music more and more i really just am aware of i am creating vibrations because even thoughts are vibrations Thoughts and intentions are vibrations sending out an energy wave that is felt <clears throat> by everything around us. The trees feel it, the animals feel it, the people feel it, the, 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 uh, your home feels it, the walls of your home feel it. So everything is vibration and frequency and that's a whole nother subject. But what we do is, as a sound healer is to create vibrations that are known to be soothing and aligning for the body to relax and align itself. Like when the meridians are lined up, when the energy flows are lined up, when the energy is flowing through the body, it's not blocked, then the body comes into what we call homeostasis. So I call it hoha, homeostatic harmony. Oh, beautiful. Our body's always seeking homeostatic harmony. And so anytime we can be around, I mean, being by a river, by a creek, by the ocean, listening to the frogs, the birds, the crickets, if we relax into those, they, 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 it's, it's like what we call entrainment. There's a way that the rhythmic flow, again, back to the ocean waves, back to the, 
uh, the waves of consciousness. They even say the brain waves are different brain wave states of the uh, delta, theta, beta, alpha states of consciousness are very slow frequencies, very slow, like six to eight hertz, which is six beats per second, very slow, blah, 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 blah. very low tones. So low frequency, lo-fi is a is kind of a popular term in in uh, cult in popular culture sometimes lo-fi, and I think it's related to low frequencies being very healing. People love the subwoofer, whoa, the bass. Mm -hmm. So there's basically just an intention to create a sonic field that's relaxing and allowing the person to feel safe enough to relax in that container and breathe evenly and slowly and deeply. And oftentimes people just go to sleep because they're so exhausted. That's what they need. If they're a little more awake, they may go into more of a trance-like state and or a more dream-like state. There's all these different states you can be in, dream-like, trance-like, sleep, right? All those different and so the sound healer is just there to create a sonic frequency container in which to relax and allow the body to heal itself. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. And I'm resonating with that lo-fi and I have some thoughts about that regarding what some people consider low frequency emotions. And in our culture, kind of our new age culture, there can be a, an idea around, oh no, we don't want any low vibe here. <laughs> we don't want any low vibes here, man. We vibe, we high vibe and only. All right. Right. This is, this is a thing that I've come across recently and I've wondered actually personally, why does that bother me so much? And as I'm listening to you, I'm realizing that for me, what can be called a low frequency emotion are sometimes emotions that are already in the healing space, or they're an emotion that needs to be healed or like kind of raising their hand for healing right? or to have the surrender to drop into what can be considered a low frequency emotion can be healing in itself because there's so much acceptance, like dropping down to the sand on the beach at the ocean, feeling the support of the earth, allowing weight and gravity to have its play with each other. That's all low. Those are what I think of with the bass tones. And I find so much healing and pleasure that I wouldn't ever want to exercise any of that for my life. Like exercise, meaning do away yeah. with. Yeah, yeah. I, I embrace those low vibrations. I think they call it spiritual bypass in a way. So you don't want to be dealing with, you know, just stay high frequency all the time. Stay positive all the time. You know, you're such a downer. What are you bringing that in for? That's interesting. Is that actually a term that they're using in, in psychotherapy, low five vibrations? Not in psychotherapy. In some of the courses around abundance, around manifestation, or, I mean, things that can work for some people. So I'm not speaking about this in terms of a hard line, but for me, I really accept and allow for it all. And I have a difficult time when something is not allowed. Yeah, of course. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's a very common thing in many uh, new age consciousness practices and there's probably it's everything swings you know culture swings back and forth you know every 30 years right it's things swing back and forth and so everything comes back and ultimately you have to embrace all of our emotions and all of our feelings and in some ways the buddhist practice of just not identifying with them just okay you're not attached to them you just say okay that's what i'm feeling and it's okay to feel that that's the main thing permission to feel it's okay to feel like i won't say the word um because we're recording and we have to be clean but you know to feel bad oh okay the feel bad word <laughs> <laughs> 
the SH word. <laughs> yeah, feel bad word, which happens to all of us. And so being able, and of course, not being stuck in it is the same as not being stuck in, in the high vibe world and just disowning or denying all the feel bad places. So yeah, it's always about a balance, which is why I use the elements. It's a balance in some ways you can say the dirt and the mud, you know, laying in the mud. We think of that as, oh, you stuck in the mud, but actually people do consciously mud baths to heal their body, to coat yourself in mud and let all the toxins be drawn out. So it's really a flow and, and, and a balance of all the emotions. I can totally understand and relate to what you're talking about. Yeah, no lo-fi here, man. But the thing is, <laughs> it's so, it's so actually when all the frequencies are there, then we're in balance and we feel mm -hmm. good. That's right. Because we're not too high and flying and like way out there, not grounded. At the same time, we're not stuck in the mud. It's like yes. there's something about flowing through. And of course, I heard Burning Man was that quite that experience this year was quite transformational because of the mud because of the rain, mm -hmm. because of the elements coming in and challenging. I mean, I know as a wilderness guide for many, many years that that experience of uh, spending a week in the rain or the snow outside is, is definitely a difficult and transformative at the same time experience because one of the challenges of our cultures were detached from nature too much. So we don't experience those hard times Mm -hmm. And it uh, so, sort of goes along with, I don't want to experience cold. I don't want to experience wet. I don't want to experience pain. I don't want to experience any of those lo-fi emotions because they're too hard to deal with. And I just don't want to deal with them. At the same time, we really do need to, to be with them and, and ask them, what's your gift? What do you need? What's your, have a conversation. Like that's what we're, we're having a conversation now. Mm -hmm. Conversation is where all learning occurs. Lectures is a one-way conversation. They're boring. I only want to hear someone talk and lecture if I can have a conversation with them and understand more mm -hmm. just in, in, in the conversation. So having a conversation with those, I can see you would definitely want to, uh, in some ways, you're, you're, you're some ways always a little bit the devil's advocate. You're always like wanting to bring in the other side and balance things. That's mm -hmm. your nature. <laughs> Thank you for saying that in me. It's true. <laughs> and and you, Bodhi, are such a multifaceted healer and amazing soul on this planet. And not only are you a sound healer, but you're also an author. Indeed. You know, I don't, I'm not a prolific author. That's for sure. Writing is difficult for me. I love to write, but I love to write when I feel like writing. A real author gets up and writes, no matter what. Now I get up and play music, no matter what. I practice and I do my music. Writing is more of an inspiration and inspired thing. And it's been very arduous for me to, I was thinking I would get a ghostwriter to write this book. And I tried thinking into that, feeling into that, and I couldn't, I ended up finding a collaborator to bounce things off of and write it together because I, I, I need help to, conversation is how I bring the ideas out. I know all these things and it's difficult for me to go from my mind to paper. So talking, and that's one way to write a book is to talk. So I talked a lot and recorded a lot of things and then I go back and edit it. I love editing. So I am creating a book called Five Elements of Sound Healing. And I think you have a, I sent you a picture of it. It's uh, been really a journey to create. I created the cover in a way first to create a container, again, the container to pour all the information into because that's like, okay, we're doing this now. And uh, it's just almost finished. And probably if people are interested in it, they can send me a, a message through Soundscape Oasis, send me an email and I'll be sending out uh, information about that book. And hopefully it'll be up in the next couple of months as I'm laying it out right now, it's been quite a process to distill down what I felt was important. And after all, I realized it's in some ways it's a beginning book. It's a primer on sound healing because it's such a vast field that I, and I didn't try to cover everything. 
I wanted to just focus on a few basic principles and my approach to it and balancing sound healing and music. That's the biggest thing that I'm bringing forth. I'm a musician, a trained musician, and I love bringing in the elements of music into sound healing. And so that's a lot of what my book is about, bridging the sound healing world and the music world. I'm so glad you're doing this and writing this book, Bodhi. And the cover is beautiful. I just am so excited to have the entire book on my shelf and to read it. And one of the books I do have on my shelf is your first book, which is Tao of Music. Yeah, that's more of a uh, of a, uh, a spontaneous, almost like a memoir in a weird way. It's uh, stories about my life as a musician and being on the path. I broke the book down into five parts, uh, discovering the path, awakening to the path, being on the path, challenges on the path, one with the path, and letting go of the path. So it's this progression, and then we go through that maybe many times in our life. We go through these cycles, just like every year we go through four seasons. And you know that now living in the East Coast more than ever, and I know it now living in Mount Shasta, there is definitely four seasons. I mean, winter is very different from summer. It's like black and white, so different. And so we go through these seasons in our life, these cycles of, of discovering something, going into it, experiencing it, challenging it, hating it, loving it, and then being one with it, and then letting go of it. So that book is more vignettes about stories of my life and discovering the word quilence, which is my favorite word now, quilence. Teach us. Did you read that chapter, quilence? I don't remember it. It's Go what? find the quilence chapter. Oh my gosh, Bodhi, now I have an assignment. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, quilence. Quilence is because there really is no silence except in a vacuum. And oh, in that's a vacuum, right. If you can create a vacuum container, you can actually hear your inner, your inner symphony. You can hear your heartbeat. You can hear the ringing in your ears. You can feel the blood. You can hear the blood rushing through. You can feel the energy in your body moving, the chi. You can hear the sonic representation of the energy, the vibration. So we have silence and we have quiet. Now quiet usually, when people say silence, they usually mean quiet. They usually mean no human voice is talking. But if you stop and listen, there's a lot of sound around you, whether it's the birds or whether it's the refrigerator or whether it's the freeway or whether it's the ocean, whatever it is, wherever you are, even in the quietest of places, you might hear the wind rustling through the leaves there's always some sound. So silence is a sound. That's my favorite new thing I just made up. <laughs> <laughs> That's my new little meme. Silence is a sound. So quietness came to me. I was working on the Tao of Music book, and it's more of a series of vignettes that hang together just because it's my life. Whereas this book, I needed to make the book hang together like as an actual coherent body of work, which is why it was more difficult. So the quiet story was I was sitting in a coffee shop reading my book and working on parts of it. And, and this little boy, probably nine years old, I don't know, eight, he seemed young. He ran up to me. His dad was sitting over across from me. He ran up to me. He said, do you want to hear the new word I just made up? And I said, of course. And he said, quiet. And then he ran off. And I was just sitting there going like, and I was just working on the whole, I was, and actually I was, I was working on that. There's a whole, I was just thinking about that. It was like this angel came to me, right? And angels come in the form of humans all the time. You know that. There are angels all around us. Their beauty always surrounds us. So it's like, I was stunned. I just sat there for a while and I was like, oh my God. And I don't remember if I went over to him and asked if I could use that word, but it was, uh, it just, it just brought everything together for me. Quietness, that space between silence and quiet. Mm. Completely mm -hmm. still, as still as possible. And it just, it's, it almost, it, it evokes a pillow of stillness. Ooh, I like that. A pillow of stillness. I have to write that down. <laughs> pillow of stillness. 
So that's that gave me a, a word because we're always trying to get closer with words to describe what we experience and the words never get there. They just get closer. So the quiescence word just brought me into that. It brings a sense of stillness to my being. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can read all about it in the chapter and in the, in the book. Yes, I remember now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you did read the book. <laughs> I did. Yes. No, I love that book. I love it. And I did read that chapter and, and you jogged my memory. I'm sorry I wasn't connecting no, the dots fine. right away. You have a few other things to remember in your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love what you're sharing with us about the boy and the angels and our lives that sometimes show up as people. And you are definitely one of my angels. <laughs> <laughs> well, that goes both ways. And in a, any true relationship, it does. Reciprocity is a, a very highly underrated skill. So true. Listening, listening, listening. I listen a lot. Even in the first chapter, the introduction of this new book, I state that right out that I do a lot of listening. I s listen a lot. Just stopping and listening, paying attention to the sounds around us. What is going on? And then you start to feel. Yes. Yes. I find listening to be an eternal skill, meaning that when I step into listening, it's as though the listening has always been happening. And also there's no end point. There's no moment where I am a good listener as a determined skill. It's more like, am I listening now? Because now is also a moment to listen. I agree with you. And I would say that there is layers of listening that there is conscious, it never stops, of course, because our, as long as our ears are open, there's sound coming in and we're perceiving the sound. And we're also, the thing that we need to expand with sound healing is that, we're, is that we feel vibrations as much as we hear them. That's the important, when you start to feel the vibrations as much as hear them, then you realize you're feeling the, all the, you're multi-sensorial, multi-sensorially experiencing multi-sensorially experiencing the world. And when we pay attention to what we're listening to, that's another layer beyond just letting it drift in. It's always happening. And like you said, there's no end point. There's no beginning because we're always, the waves never stop. We're always just a matter of what we're paying attention to. You know, attention and intention. An intention creates attention and attention awakens intention and it's again this wave so the the words never quite get there and i love is a skill listening is a skill we can practice mm -hmm. yes and i love words as pointers and as you're speaking i am gaining the benefit of you using words as pointers because that unnameable is what words point to and right. when words are used well enough, we actually get to that unnameable through the words, even right. though the words are coming and going. Well, it's almost like we are the bow and the, the arrow is a, the word is an arrow. And so the arrow does go. And if there's no target, it just keeps going. If there's nothing there, it just keeps going. But if there is something to see, it might hit the target and awaken us to, oh, wow, there's a target here. Yes. Wow, there's something here. The word just hit something. It bounced off it, and the word wasn't it, but the word, like you said, pointed. They're pointers. They're arrows of consciousness, of awakening that just, uh, maybe that's why Cupid has an, a bow and arrow. Oh, my <laughs> God. I never put that together. Holy moly. Cupid has a bow and arrow. Oh, gosh. That just brings me right back to the story of St. Valentine that you yes. gifted oh, oh my. my sister and I with when we were kids. One of the true versions of who St. Valentine was. I don't even remember what that story is about, but I do remember the book and I remember mm. that I gave it to you. Yeah, it's all about love. It's all it's about, all about love. love. 